This episode is brought to you by our incredible community of listener supporters on Patreon. Our Patreon offers listeners exclusive archival content, extended episodes, and access to community conversations diving deeper with past guests. Your monthly pledge ensures that For the Wild has the funding to keep producing informative, thoughtful, and rooted conversations and programming. All funding supports our small team of creatives, podcast production, and special For the Wild projects like our zines and slow study courses. To support us on Patreon, please visit patreon.com slash for the wild, or if you would rather make a one-time donation or recurring donation outside of Patreon, please visit for the wild.world slash donate. Hello for the wild community. This week, we are excited to continue our collaboration with UC Berkeley's Othering and Belonging Institute to bring you a conversation from the Othering and Belonging Conference in Berlin, Germany. This conversation is introduced by Monica Jang and is moderated by Cecilie Surasky and features the voices of Udi Raz and Yasmin Dar. Speaking on the theme, turning towards each other, not against each other, bridging in times of crisis, the panelists address what it means to build towards collaboration in difficult times, especially in the context of the war on Gaza. Since this conversation was recorded on November 14th, 2023, the genocide in Gaza has continued and worsened, and the loss of so many lives is tragic and incomprehensible. The words offered here aim to make space to honor pain and simultaneously to explore generative forms of allyship in the face of such violence. We hope you find this conversation meaningful. Thank you for listening. So I discovered there's only one antidote when you are in fear, and that is to go to who your other is. That is to go to where your fear is. That is to be in community with the people and to learn the history, to understand and and accompany and find a place of shared experience, shared life, shared grief. Since October 7, uh, we've witnessed unbearable, unspeakable violence and, and really too many lives lost in Palestine, Israel, and Gaza. And we've seen communities around the world uh, polarize and, and fragment over profound questions uh, about whose lives are grievable and whose are not, and who is able to speak up and who is not able to speak up. So in the following panel turning towards each other and not against each other, bridging in times of crisis, we really hope to open a space where we can honor each other's pain, where we find ways of bridging, despite that groups are pitted against one another right now, and explore generative forms of allyship and collaboration. So with that, I'd love to welcome the moderator of this panel, Cecily Saraski, who's the communications director at OBI and who's been working on a range of justice and equity issues over the past decades, including building the largest progressive Jewish grassroots organization in the United States, Jewish Voice for Peace. So welcome, Cecily. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, And thank you, Monica, for reminding us that we have bodies we have breath, we have heartbeats, that we are connected to the earth and the land and this planet and that we belong to it and that we are connected to each other and we belong to each other. One of the features of othering is to paraphrase Judith Butler, because you can't have a conference like this without paraphrasing Judith Butler, (laughs) Um, is this idea of drawing a line between those who are grievable and those who are not. And so there are questions about 
who draws the line or what institutions draw those lines? Are we actually drawing the lines that we find within our bodies? What is non-negotiable for us is there should be no line ever. Everyone is grievable. Everyone belongs. Every life is precious. We are a life affirming. We are life affirming in our vision of belonging for everyone. And this is an extraordinary moment in time. And I want to ask for your grace, your patience, your love and care, especially for our incredible guests. We pulled this together. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, um, many people in this room. We pulled this together in just a couple of days. And Yasmin and Uri are absolutely extraordinary human beings. We are so lucky to have them in conversation. And it is really important to me because this is such an incredibly painful and emotional time in a way that reverberates, I think, for people throughout the world. We've seen fragmentation happening in our schools, in our workplaces, in our families, in our communities, because of this question in part about grievability. People might be surprised to know, I know I was when I first started reading headlines, um, that Jews and Israeli Jews were moving back to Berlin about 10, 15 years ago. It was a bit of a scandal and shocking and also kind of amazing. I mean, almost unimaginable. Folks may also be surprised to know that Berlin has one of the largest Palestinian communities outside of the Middle East something like 30 to 40,000 people, significantly larger even than the, than the Jewish and Israeli community that's here. And while there are individuals who are in deep pain and grieving all throughout our communities, there's an incredible asymmetry in power and in who can demonstrate publicly their sympathy for Palestinians versus the state and how it connects to an idea of grief with Israelis. One of the things we're going to complicate, and I just want to remind people, is governments are not people. We are incredibly complex. John said something yesterday, the other is an illusion a dangerous one, but the other is an illusion. And it's so interesting to me. And, and, you know, in Western culture, we think in terms of these profound dualities, you know, black and white and, and, and male and female and um, tall and short. And um, the, the foundational duality that we all often refer to without even thinking about it, the unreconcilable opposition is often Israeli-Palestinian. And I hear people talk about it all the time. And, it, and in my own life, as a Jewish person, I had to make a decision about the person and the people who, who I was told by the culture at large and by these narratives was my other. And we know that when you project onto another, you feel fear when you encounter them, even in the mind, especially in the mind, maybe only in the mind, you feel it in your solar plexus. You feel anxiety. You feel all of these things that we're all feeling right now, especially when we're um, co-created by, by Twitter and the news and the way that it is it triggering aspects of us, um, our own fear and manipulating that fear. I learned that the only antidote to that kind of perpetual misery, and I'd also say loneliness. Those of us who are Jewish know we were raised, you know, the world, not all of us, I, I, um, but there is a sense of the world hates us. And we were raised with this idea. And when you hear that enough, you start to internalize it, right? We tell stories enough, long enough, those stories start to tell us. And it's not a fun place to be. 
when you think that. And it also, when you are in fear, it gives permission to, to cause deep and profound harm as a form of defense. So I discovered there's only one antidote to, to that. And that is to go to who your other is. That is to go to where your fear is. That is to be in community with the people and to learn the history, to understand and, and accompany and find a place of shared experience, shared life, shared grief. I'm going to share two stories before we bring our guests on. John told a lot of stories yesterday, so um, I'm going to take that as permission because they are beautiful stories. Uh, the first time I went to the West Bank, uh, I went with a Palestinian friend of mine, and there are a few of us, and we were in Ramallah for the week. And I had an extraordinary week. She just pulled out all the stops. And we met friends, um, people doing fascinating, amazing work. We would go, I remember going, going to a restaurant, like a family restaurant, where there, and those of you who are Palestinian know this, like almost like um, a Jeopardy game every night and everybody comes out and, and, and people are playing games and, and their contests. And, and I just, I, I was so en enlivened by the humans that I met. As I was leaving, I was going through the checkpoint back to Jerusalem, and there was a young soldier named Yosef. I still remember his name, and he probably was not more than 18 years old. Uh, he appeared to be Ethiopian Jewish. He looked at me, and he saw my suitcase, and he asked me, why do you have a suitcase? I said, oh, I've just been in Ramallah for the week, and he looked at me, and he said, Ramallah, Ramallah is garbage. Why are you in Ramallah? Go to Jerusalem. And in that moment, I understood there was an entire, extraordinary, beautiful world right in front of him, literally five feet away, that he could not see, that he had been raised with such fear, that it, he was incapable. And it is scary. You hand an 18-year-old a gun. You tell, you know, it is, it is a very scary situation for human beings. And these are kids. And he could not see the world around him. And I realized we're, I've, we're all Yosef. We all are. We all have these profound blind spots in our lives and in our world that have been created by fear, created by the state, created by education, all kinds of things. And so to encounter each other is often the most profound thing we can do. And so. The other thing I want to say is I, I, I'm an illusion. I look like one person, but actually there are many people who have co-created me. And I have had many conversations over the last few days and our colleagues and, and Basima and Hussein and Ramon and Sarah and John, many of us in deep conversation. I do want to say um, that there should be more people on this stage, but they do not feel safe to be on this stage. And we're going to talk about that, the political circumstances, what it means to not only be humans together, but to have a thriving democracy requires that we all be able to grieve, that we all be able to show up. But there are people both from the United States and definitely Germany who have asked that I not mention their names and who, who I would love to have on the, on the um, stage with us and they can't. So I want us to hold that in our hearts. Um, I'm going to bring on our, our, our incredible folks. Yasmin Daher, would you come on? Huge round of applause. Huge, 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 huge. And Udi Raz. Whoa. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, um, it's bright up here. It is bright. It is bright. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to read 
the, the, the bios, the short bios that Yasmin and Udi uh, gave us. But I, I want to say that the thing that's most important and moving to me is not only that in just a few days time, both of you dropped what you were doing and said, with very little preparation, this is important and it matters. And we are happy to do this. You did it with, with significant courage. Um, this is an extraordinary emotional time. And so for us to even make this request of you is, I want to recognize that and the sacredness of that choice you've made. And I want to say you're both, I mean, Sarah and I had breakfast with you the other day and we just fell in love with, with, with you and thought, how lucky are we to have you? So just as humans, I just want to say that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yasmin, Yasmin Dacher, is a feminist activist and a writer. She holds a doctorate degree from the Department of Philosophy, University of Montreal, with a focus on ethics and political <laughs> philosophy. She has taught previously in different institutions, including Birzeit University in Palestine and Simone de Beauvoir Institute in Canada. She is currently the co-director and editorial director of Febrer, Febrer, yes. a network for independent Arab media organizations based in Berlin. Udi is a doctoral fellow at the Berlin Graduate School of Muslim Cultures and Societies. There, she investigates the contemporary self-understanding of Germany as a nation state, as it emerges through public attempts to regulate encounters between Muslims and Jews. Muslims and Jews. We can talk about that. She grew up in Haifa between Tel Aviv and Beirut. Her work is shaped by local and global anti and decolonial, as well as queer liberation movements. She has lived in Berlin since 2010, where she first studied culture and history of the Middle East and then Islamic studies at the Free University Berlin. Roz is a board member of the Germany-based organization Jewish Voice for Just Peace in the Middle East. All right. So the first question I just want to ask is, how have you been for these weeks? What have these weeks been like for each of you? Yasmin, may I start with you? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Cecily. Thank you for uh, the encouragement and also the, the grace and for uh, putting this quickly uh, together. Um, and um, I know that for me, it was a commitment um, in the past few years, but definitely in the past few weeks, that whenever there's an opportunity to speak about what's happening in Palestine, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it's been difficult. Uh, it's been uh, very difficult uh, weeks. Um, I... I don't think I, it, there is an unprecedented amount of um, hatred towards the Palestinians, especially in the uh, media and amongst uh, international actors. And here I would also reiterate the differentiation you made between the people and governments. Um, so the... The, um, the amount, uh, the, the discourse in the media against the Palestinians, uh, it's scary. And uh, there is a genocidal talk, uh, human animals, human uh, shields, uh, kill them all, etc. And I, I've been, I mean, I am Palestinian myself, and I've been active several years. And I don't think I ever felt um, that this is, beyond um, the normal. There is, we're becoming at, this is a point where our lives are disposable uh, and there is, um, there is no, no value and we feel like we, we need to tell people, human beings, we need to live in freedom, in dignity. And um, yeah, I, uh, it, it, 
I mean, of course, we, we feel the solidarity also of uh, populations, of communities. Um, but living in Berlin is, is, it, is difficult um, um, recently. Um, but maybe we, we talk about this as we <laughs> continue the conversation. Yeah, well, I, I share the same experience. The dimension and the resolution uh, by which we are now uh, facing repression and oppression and oppression by by the German state as such is uh, scary and it's frustrating. But in the same time, I must say in an, on an optimistic note uh, that it also brings us together. And the fact that we are allowed to speak here today with you and to share with you our perspective, it's uh, became in a way kind of, kind of quite uh, almost a miracle in a democratic state, which is mind-blowing to my understanding. I also want to share with you shortly why, why I'm here, actually, because uh, maybe it's important to, to say I was uh, born and raised in Haifa. Does anybody know what is Haifa? Yeah? <laughs> could, could you drop a name of uh, the area? <laughs> How would you name it? Haifa, Haifa right? Some people would, would name it Israel. Some people name it Palestine. I grew up in Haifa. Haifa is famous, is known as a city where Palestinians and Jews live together. So as a young boy, it was already clear to me that the place where I'm living in has more than one name, and it was absolutely fine about me. It's still absolutely fine about me. But I also grew up to understand that my positionality as a Jewish person within this geographical area also prescribes a certain of hegemonic <coughs> positionality towards all other people who live in the same area who cannot claim Jewish identification. It was important for me, and it's still very much important for me nowadays, to raise a voice against such a system that uh, prescribes injustice by its very essence. But there are also people who are willing uh, to resistance against such an oppressing system to sacrifice the life and to kill other people. And it's true also to those who wish to maintain the current state of injustice on both sides, as people like to try to, to understand the situation there. And to me, it was in a certain time in my life, it was enough. I just wanted to go away. It, I, I felt like I'm, it is a war zone. And I was looking for a place where I could finally take deeper breath and connect to myself to make new friendship, to understand who I am in this crazy world. But you can imagine that it was important for me to raise a voice also here in Germany against the oppression system that I saw over there. So you can imagine how surprising I was when I'm arriving in Berlin, in Germany, and sharing my own life experience with individuals who were socialized in the context of Germany, they would often argue I would be anti-Semitic. <laughs> the German guilt, right? So wh where does it come from, this understanding that a Jew can so easily be marked as an anti-Semitic? You know? So somebody says correctly, I believe also the same way, it's, it has to do with German guilt. And the way that German politicians deal with this guilt as many forms, we saw it in migration laws and uh, restitutionen, restitutions, compensations. And there is also this attempt, ongoing attempt of siding with the state of Israel, doesn't matter what Israel is doing. For Palestinian people living in Israel, Palestine, this means literally they are deprived of basic human rights. In Germany, the fact that we are not allowed to talk about our life experiences as migrants, but also as Germans, some, many of us have the German citizenship. This underlines that while in Palestine, Israel, Palestinians are deprived of basic human rights, here in Germany, Palestinians as such are deprived of basic civic rights. So let me make it very clear. If we assume that Palestinians and Jews share the same values as human beings from a German perspective, this is already 
an argument to frame you as an anti-Semitic. So I'm happy to sit here on the stage with two amazing anti-Semites. <laughs> <laughs> let, <me also, laughs> let me also make it clear that uh, probably those, uh, there is always this uh, argument that uh, you become anti-Semitic through proximity to those who already speak anti-Semitically. So those who sit in the first row... <laughs> I have something to inform you, and I believe within 40 minutes, the people in the back will also <laughs> join our circle. some of the story that 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 Udi's talking about from your perspective of of the particularities well there's there are many elements to the story that you you raised one might be from your perspective and your feminist perspective and Palestinian perspective how you would call the governmental structure in Israel uh and we talk about structures of othering and this idea of belonging for you where your even your own <clears throat> personal and political sense of belonging in Israel or not yeah so um i grew up in in nazareth uh, and i also think it's a city that many of you do know where it is yeah famous um so it's not far away from haifa and while we Speaking uh, behind the scenes, we, f we figured out that we both uh, have another language. Uh, we spoke Hebrew um, in the backstage. And um, I, I studied in Tel Aviv University. And uh, I, uh, I actually left um, uh, to do my, my PhD in, uh, in Canada. And um, I think in the whole geography... Uh, of Palestine, Israel, Palestine 48, whatever you want to name it, the, from the river to the sea, okay? Uh, it's, uh, there is one entity that rules, and that is Israel. Um, so the, the details of the kind of uh, um, treatment you are getting, um, it obviously varies between being a citizen of uh, the uh, the state, but uh, not getting your civic rights, or being um, uh, living in an open air prison like in Gaza, or being used as a cheap labor in Bundestag in the West Bank. Um, so it varies, but it all maybe falls within the category that. Uh, Hannah Arendt calls um, like the the right to have rights. So we don't have the right to have rights. None of us in this whole area between the river and the sea, as Palestinians living under the apartheid or the settler colonialism that Israel is enacting upon us for seventy five years. 
Um, so I, I moved to, to Germany, Berlin, um, in a, a, a year after many, uh, thousands of Syrians fled, uh, Syria, uh, because of the, uh, regime's, uh, uh repression and, uh, crimes. Um, because I was writing my uh, PhD dissertation on the question of how do we live together. Uh, so um, I, um, I was thinking about all those political uh, movements and instances where we come together and try to, um, to bring up something new, to liberate ourselves and those around us. And I thought, okay, I, I wanted to be closer to this community and I wanted to belong also. Um, I, I wanted to feel geographically closer to the area I grew up in, which is the Middle East. So Berlin feel, felt way closer than uh, um, Canada. But also there is <clears throat> emerging big uh, Arab uh, community. And anyway, Berlin, as you, as you mentioned, uh, it hosts a lot of uh, Palestinians. To my dismay, I was surprised uh, also, although I knew a little bit, uh, how much you do not have the right to speak as a Palestinian in the German context about any uh, pain, grieving, uh, suffering, uh, occupation, nothing that you uh, live through. People get extremely uncomfortable uh, about it, <clears throat> but also uh, different institutions shut down from this discourse. They don't want this brought up. Uh, and, um, and I think recently it's playing out also in, in, in some extreme and horrific instances where Police is brutalizing people in the streets. Demonstrations are banned. Uh, any public speaking will have repercussions. People are um, um, thrown out of their jobs, uh, losing funding for their projects, uh, defunded, canceled, smear campaigns, etc., etc., etc. So the it's um, it's a moment where uh, I mean. Yeah, maybe I'll let you ask more questions because I'm, I'm, I can't just continue. <laughs> no, that's, I think we're going to keep circling yeah. in and spiraling in, in, into these. And, and, and I have to say, part of me thought cynically, oh, it sounds like the United States, um, in certain, in certain ways, but it's also very different and we shouldn't conflate the two mm. as the same experience. And so I want to, Uri, if you can talk about I had a conversation with with someone, um, my new friend Pam, who who is one of the attendees here, who said, you know, one of the reasons I'm here, I came from the United States, is we, as we know, have a deep and profound history of 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 genocide um, and slavery in the United States, and to put it mildly, have not done a a, a good job. Uh, uh, in fact, right now there's a political uh, very active political pressure opposing sort of educational recognition of our history. Uh, and from her perspective, she was like, well, you know, Germany has this profound history of genocide, but they have done things. They have a commitment to a kind of collective memory that from our perspective seems extraordinary. And I have to say that as, you know, as a Jewish person, when I walk down the street and I see stumbling stones that tell me about actual human beings who lived in those homes, it's incredibly Jewish human beings who were taken from their homes and put into camps and, and so forth. It, it moves me deeply. And so I'm but this, so I don't want to, um, I, I, I want to hear a little bit about that history of, of how that happened and how it's also not a neutral political process. That what Yasmin, you're talking about is deeply related to this decision around what, what collective history Germany can hold. And in fact, German identity itself. 
So if you could kind of explain that, we have people from all over who may not understand some of this. Um, I'm not sure where I should begin uh, the historical inquiry. Like, should we talk about this end of the Second World War or from there? Or what, what, where would you uh, direct the question? Yeah, I, I suppose we could spend a week on this topic. Yeah. <laughs> can, can, can you do the, T, no, the TLDR <laughs> version? No, um, uh, if you can just... Briefly, I know that, for instance, there's a word, a very long, yet another very long German word that I can't pronounce that names the process of coming to terms with the past yeah. that has become a linchpin of German national identity. Can you yeah. pronounce that word <laughs> and then explain that? How about that? So the word is called Wiedergutmachung, Wiedergutmachen, and it literally means what you said. Um, I, I, I want to go... Uh, maybe if we talk about anti-Semitism and how Germany try nowadays to combat this, I think this is one aspect of how Germans would feel coming to terms properly with the phenomenon of uh, having Nazi history here. So if we look exactly at uh, how Germany identifies what anti-Semitism is, is what has been passed by a so-called international alliance that understands itself as uh, IHRA, International Remembrance Holocaust Alliance, which is a coalition of Western European, North American Christian countries and the state of Israel. Right? And this coalition published or passed um, 2015 uh, what they call a walking definition of anti-Semitism. According to this work in the definition of anti-Semitism, which is accompanied by uh, 11 examples, one of the examples says that if you talk about the state of Israel as a racist project, you are an anti-Semitic, which is a fair argument, but in fact, Israel is a racist state. Right? So you cannot name reality by its name, And once you do this, you are becoming part of the problem, actually. Right? 2017, the German Bund uh, government uh, adopts this definition as working definition of anti-Semitism and even extends it to specify the special relationship between the German state and the Israeli state and how this bond is, should not be questionable. Right? And since then... To my understanding, things become really terrible, not only for Palestinians, for Muslims in general, but also for Jews, and namely Jews who do not understand the necessity of having a racist state as their own representative. Right? Jews like myself who wish to understand or to explore possibilities of actually living together. And every time we do this, Literally, every time we do this, the German, Germany or its representatives, either German politicians, representatives of institutions of the state, you name it, they come to us, cut our, off our budgets, put sanctions on us, exclude us from whatever institution we're at, and remind us that what we are doing is unacceptable. Literally, Germany is not only not allowing space for such encounters, but it's fighting against such encounters. Mm -hmm. And if I may add um, to that, I think that um, it seems that there is something very threatening to the German state or maybe the modern German state uh in in this type of in this type of communities coming together and namely here i'm talking about muslim jews arabs um who are coming in solidarity for palestine and uh against state repression here or in israel um or the israeli uh, government i mean um there is something threatening because it's it's the the raison d'etre of the german state was to Um, we can make peace of, with you if with only um, in terms of separation. So we separate the Jews and then we're fine with the state of Israel. But it maybe this community reminds them 
again, this this group, uh, and again, this group which is in power, which is the uh, elite, which is the political, uh, the um, uh, politicians or political parties, um, not, necessar not necessarily a sentiment that's shared with all uh, Germans, for sure not. Uh, it reminds them of the past, so of tragedies that, as all tragedies, could have been avoided. And maybe it shakes the grounds of the the future. Uh, it shows that of the future and of the present. It shows that there is a possibility of something different that they are not interested in in having. They are not interested in this community being empowered, having a voice, and showing that there is we can come together and show uh, our own uh, way of togetherness, of living together, of uh, creating open space for us. So um, it's not, I don't know if to call it, if, if it's cynicism or it's paradoxical. I, I, I'm, I'm looking for the word where like a German would come to a Jew telling him you are anti-Semite or telling uh, us that this is, um, this is racist when we, what we are fighting against is actually uh, 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 racism. And then the, in the, in the recent uh, week, we have uh, been hearing the government clearly talking about um, expelling or uh, um, the, what's the, the word? Yeah. Uh, so revoking the citizenship of, of immigrants. Mm -hmm. If they uh, do not agree to this line of understanding uh, both of how they uh, define uh, Semitism and anti-Semitism, how they relate to the uh, state of Israel and its importance to the raison d'etre of the German uh, state. Um, yeah. There's so much in, in what you just said and shared. And one thought is that um, there is an, I'd imagine there's a narrative of German identity of, of repair with the Jews, like a, like a kind of reparations and repair. And so, so Palestinians don't fit into that narrative that in, in fact, the experience of Palestinians is, is, is deeply unsettling to a narrative of this sort of settled, we, 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 we got, you know, we moved Jews to this other place. I mean, and we know this, that early European support for, you know, Zionist colonization was, Balfour was anti-Semitic, right? Like there was this desire to move Jews elsewhere. Um, and so Palestinians are, can uh, counter to that sense of self. Is that part of what this dynamic is that that sense of we've we've done our work and um do you want to answer <clears throat> um the, how, how can palestinians can be imagined as part of germany if i may take it in this direction mm -hmm. it's a brilliant question i i will even complicate this understanding or the the difficulty of this uh idea even more because the problem has never been Palestinianness. The problem is Germany. It's that Germany that needs us to be in a state of enmity in order to justify its ex existence. Mm -hmm. But who is excluded from within body of national project? Thank you. <laughs> Who is else excluded from this understanding of this national self, surprisingly, are a lot of Jews. Think about it, that half of the population uh, of the Jew half of the Jewish population nowadays in Palestine, Israel, are Jews originated from Muslim Arab countries. Right? So what is their role in the justification process of Germany of itself? Right? They are completely neglected. If you look in on historical, uh, historic uh, school books, there is no mentioning for Jews living in Iraq, in Egypt, in Morocco. Jewish experience is located in Europe. And this is one of the problems that char characterizes the, the idea of Germany. Right? 
It excludes anything that cannot reassure the legitimacy of Europe as a neutral, natural project. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. John said something yesterday about, oh, he was talking about fascism, but it's also democratic leaders. Anyone really is, they tell you they care about you, but they don't mean it. Mm -hmm. And that is such a deep experience that I hear mm -hmm. that there's this love, there's a love that is crushing. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the, for, for this to actually, for us as people who live in, in Berlin, in Germany, to believe that they, there has been um, real coming to terms with history and with memory and uh, learning anything, um, it, this does not show up in our realities, in our experiences. Um, I'm speaking here both as a Palestinian, but also as, uh, as an activist and part of these communities. And again, especially the communities where that brings together Palestinians and Jews and Muslims and Arabs. And because for us, it's, uh, like no, no more killing or no more, uh, racism, no more exclusion. But it's not the, um, which we do not see it happening in, in our, uh, in our lives. We see Germany trying to protect one kind of people. Uh, so it's what they think is grievable and matters. Uh, but also, uh, as, uh, as Udi said, they have a very, uh, flattened, flattened idea of what the Jewish identity is and how it should act and how it should belong and where it should belong and to whom it should and or with whom it should live. And it's not with the Palestinians. Uh, and now looking at the political discourse that uh, you hear it from Schultz and other uh, uh, personas in the, uh, in the government, um, where they back Israel, the current fascist government in Israel, the, the, the far right uh, government that has uh, settlers who, uh, you know, uh, uh, disseminate weapons to uh, individuals in, set in settlements. This is their uh, activity. Um, so they are backed um, but like Germany is backing this kind of government and allowing it to do whatever it wants now in Gaza. And it's not asking for the bare minimum that if you are uh, watching the news, we'd say, oh, I would expect the German government to say ceasefire. No, peace. It, it's not in the discourse. It's really weird, awkward, scary that you look at these governments, uh, Germany, France, United uh, States, uh, the United Kingdom, and there is no talk about ceasefire. So you would think that actually Germany is, is backing the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians and from the northern of Gaza to the south, maybe Sinai or Egypt. And, um, and they, they, it's as if they cannot imagine, they cannot fathom a future where the two people can live together. And the same thing that happens there, uh, is, is brought up here maybe in, in obviously in different uh, scale and in different methods, but there is um, a suspicion towards this, this community and crushing to this community that actually shows if we believe in liberty and if we work towards uh, liberty uh, and freedom, then yeah, we can live together. We, we can find the ways.
I want to ask you about this question of of building power for change and how we define radical, what that means. And is there a way to redefine, is there a need to redefine what radical means? Is there a need to talk about relation, the power of relationality with each other, within our communities, what it takes to be in these struggles for change, what it means to build a world where everyone belongs, all of the tools that are involved. Right now, this fragmenting is happening all over the world in very intense ways. I'm feeling phone calls now from reporters asking about UC Berkeley, where we're from, and 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 the kind of uh, fissures that are developing and the open hostility. Uh, I personally have to limit my exposure to Twitter because uh, it's not only increasingly traumatic content, but it looks like a world in which we take one side or another and we have to dehumanize the other side to some degree. There is very little algorithmic support for the world you are describing and that you live in and that we live in. And so what is called upon us as, as change agents, and you may call yourself an activist, you're, you may be a teacher, you may be a neighbor, doesn't matter. We're all change agents in this work. We're all feeling it in our bodies. So not to ask you the answer to everything, but <laughs> um, Yasmin, if you could answer that, and then Udi, I, I, I would be deeply, I think we'd all be deeply grateful to hear your thoughts. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm thinking about the the terminology or the word you used, uh, radical. And um, so my my son, who's eight years old, and uh, he, I mean, we we go to together to Palestine, but he never lived there. Uh, but he speaks Arabic and German. Um, so um, so he asked me, so what 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 do the people in Gaza want? Um, and, uh, for, for the moment I was uh, like caught unprepared. It's like, w w obvious, no. <laughs> uh, so I think radicalism at this moment means for me, uh, for someone who's not supported by al the algorithm at all, <laughs> uh, that our story actually is crushed in the algorithm and everywhere. Um, it's to really deeply, honestly, fully believe that Palestinians do have the right to exist. And <laughs> exist in freedom, total, full freedom, without confinement, without living somewhere far, without uh, barriers, without the Israelis looking and surveilling uh, our lives and our bodies and our breath, and uh, really believing that we deserve this fully, without remarks, without conditions. And that would mean that people in Gaza can drive to Nazareth, they can drive to Haifa, people in Haifa can drive to Gaza. It's like, I can totally imagine that space uh, um, open, inclusive, where Jews and Palestinians can live together everywhere. So everyone who can imagine this world or can uh, maybe start from understanding that Palestinians have the right uh, to exist and he as human beings who are free uh, without uh, any constraints from uh, the state of Israel, who, again, as I said in the beginning, the only power that controls uh, that piece of land from the river to the sea, then we understand why Palestinians are calling for freedom. And that's, for me, this is the radical stance. So believing in the Palestinians' uh, right to exist in that land and again, believing that all of the people who live on that land, both Jews and Palestinians, can and should live together. And that's what everybody should push for and not more uh, violence or more uh, 
control and oppression. I totally second you. Yeah, I would like to add to that one, one personal wish. I, I really wish that my parents will live long enough to experience uh, a state where non-Jews are in power, where Palestinians are in power, and to realize that Palestinians don't treat them the way that their own government now treats Palestinians. And on a macro level, perhaps a theoretical level, I would say what is radical for me from what my life story taught me is queerness. It's queerness not only in the sense of gender constraints, but also of national constraints, of how you describe the reality that unfolds in front of you, not by being dependent on categories that are already given to you in order to group you into us and them, but to understand who, how you create a community, a safe space that can start with a group of people and grow bigger and include eventually us all. Because I think in the base of all of it, we're all human beings and this must be always the starting point for each conversation. The, the sense I get in hearing you talk about relationships that you have here in Berlin um, and this vision is, is, is resonates with me very deeply. We talk about the illusions, the illusion of the other. Um, and I would invite everyone uh, who, for whom some of this conversation might be new or even challenging to you uh, to both talk to us and go on a journey of, of, of learning and encounter and learning and seeing with your own eyes and encountering human beings and understanding histories. Uh, and, and, and how many, how many times I think those of us, again, who were told as Jews that this thing is for you, it really wasn't, right? Um, this thing that will make you safe actually for many of us hasn't, as we know from these terrible, terrible weeks, this thing that will make you more human hasn't. And this is something we can exceptionalize this, but I, but, but I do want to note that so many of the dynamics we've been discussing have come up over and over again over the last two days. This is not exceptional. There are many people who have had experiences. Every experience is distinct, but having governments promise us safety um, at the price of othering and other people, those of us from the United States know this very well. We, the, the ways that we have justified extraordinary, extraordinary numbers of deaths in Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth. So I really invite us to actually weave this story into our other stories so we can have a broader vision and broader understanding of the relationships between Euro European colonialism and white supremacy and all of these structures, the military industrial complex, all of these things are deeply, deeply intertwined. This is not a separate story in that regard. And with that, our time is up. Thank you so very much. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of For the Wild. The music you heard today is by Ariana Saraha and Amo Amo. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, Julia Jackson, Jackson Kroof, Evan Tenenbaum, and Jose Alejandro Rivera.